Epilogue. In January of 1991, I was captured by the LAPD for assault and grand theft auto. These charges stemmed from a healthy beating I had given a stubborn crack dealer who had refused to stop selling his product on my corner. His van was confiscated because of his stubborn insistence, which led to the GTA charge. I make no excuses for this, and I have no regrets. When the police and other government agencies don't seem to care about what is going on in our communities, then those of us who live in them must take responsibility for their protection and maintenance. As it turned out, this specific dealer was also a paid police informant. Because of my terrible record, I faced a 17-year sentence. I eventually pleaded guilty and received seven years. When I arrived back at prison, I was immediately put in solitary confinement for an indefinite stay, charged with being a threat to institutional security. I am now into my third year of solitary confinement. I admit that I am responsible for deeds that have caused irreparable damage, such as taking a life, but I did so in a setting that seemed to dictate such action. I do not mean to place total blame on outside forces, though they do play a prominent role in my behavior and that of many others. But I feel I've done nothing to warrant the treatment I've received since returning to prison. I am held here in isolation because of my political views and for assertions I've made. Many developments have taken place since my capture and incarceration. Kershon has given up dealing drugs and has come into the new African independence movement. He and his wife have had a child, which I think has contributed greatly to his awareness. He now travels throughout the country giving lectures on the all-powerful trappings of gang activity and gang life. He and I are still the closest in my family. Tamu and I got married just months before my incarceration and we had another child, Sanyika Kashif Shakur. Crazy D escaped the gas chamber and was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He's still dedicated to gangsterism. One of the most important things to occur was that Rodney King beating, which is not unusual given the current relationships between the new African community and the police. The unique thing about the incident, though, was that it was filmed by someone from the community and shown by the media, which says a lot in itself. For me, it was not so much the beating itself that hit home, but the repeated sight of it actually happening in all of its ugliness. The obvious helplessness of Rodney King as he pummeled continuously by the robot-like gunslingers, despite the fact that he was clearly submitting. This summed up for me the condition of the new African man in this country. Rodney King could have been any new African male in America. He could have been my son. This incident also brought the realization of my powerlessness crashing down upon me and with it my rage and appetite for destruction rose. It was while in this mindset that I clearly understood the agitated rage meted out during the 1992 rebellion in Los Angeles which was truly surprising to me. I wasn't surprised that it occurred. That was inevitable but I was surprised by the swiftness with which it unfolded. Some people say that the participants burned their own neighborhoods, which seems crazy as saying that the Vietnamese destroyed their land to rout out the Americans. The point I'm trying to make is that the businesses that were destroyed were not owned by the people who lived in those communities. They were owned and operated by folks who live in the suburban areas. The services that they were supplying were provided at astronomical prices and the products were often inferior. No matter how many times try to paint a different scenario, there was a collective consciousness among the press that is evidenced in their selection of targets and items taken. As a victim of exploitation, I know the mindset of the average rebel who took part in the burning and expropriation of goods. What it boils down to is an overwhelming sense of inadequacy. The invisible man syndrome. The contributing factors are complex and many, and no singular person or group has the absolute solution. From what I've seen and studied, it would seem that this country's 130-year-old experiment of multiculturalism has failed. Perhaps it was never designed to work. My fear is that an atmosphere is developing here similar to that in Bosnia and Herzegovina due to the failure of positive multicultural existence. My personal belief is that separation is the solution. 
the majority of Crips and Bloods have come together under the banner of a ceasefire, an effort which I applaud. But realistically, it hasn't accomplished the objective, which I believe was sidetracked by the open media coverage. Before there can ever be a Crip and Blood piece, there must be a Crip and Crip piece. As evidenced by the accounts in this book, the number one enemy of the Crips is other Crips. This fact must be addressed before any one Crip set can come forth with an offer of peace to the Bloods. Although the ceasefire is still holding in Watts, where CJ from Bounty Hunter and Tony Bogart from PJ Watts first organized it, other parts of South Central are still conducting their talks with Foolies, Body Armor, and Pagers. During the writing of this epilogue, two A-Trades have been killed, reportedly by Rolling Sixties, bringing the A-Trade death toll to 32. And what about the children? What do we tell them, or our wives? How do we come to grips with the fact that this thing has gotten way too real, out of control, like some huge snowball rolling down a hill, threatening to smash and kill all in its path, including those who originally fashioned it? Time is of the essence. And every thinking person with a stake in life, especially those involved in the fighting, should put forth an effort, something more concrete than a media truce, to deal with this tragedy. The children deserve to have a decent childhood where they live. They shouldn't have to be uprooted to the suburbs to experience peace. We cannot contaminate them with our feuds of madness, which are predicated on factors over which we have no control.